Welcome back, friends and followers. Uh, my name is Curtis Schmidt. I am the Zoological Collections Manager. And what we're going to do today is something a little different. Um, if you've seen me in the past and you've watched some of my, my previous videos, um, you may have noticed that we talked about the, the scientific collections being the backbone of museums such as Sternberg, natural history museums. It's not always the fancy exhibits that people come to see. It's actually built around the scientific research collections. Um, I also talked a little bit about one of the primary reasons why we have collections like this, and that is to store important voucher specimens. And what I mean by a voucher specimen is basically when a scientist goes out to do some work, and either publishes something or, or prints a report for a government agency and says species X, Y, and Z were found during this survey. We have to have actual specimens representing those species so that we know what we're talking about. So anybody can go back, you know, a hundred years later and say, okay, that is what this person found at this site. So one of the things that we do is we're a repository for government agencies, state of Kansas, state of Nebraska, things like that, uh, even uh, federal government agencies. So again, one, one of the main things that we use these collections for is measuring and monitoring biological diversity, if you remember me talking about that in the past. So what that basically means in a nutshell is what lives in a given place at a given time so you go out and you survey an area, and then you deposit voucher specimens from what you find into an institution like this. And then you can do it again 10, 20, 100 years later and see how things change through time. So that would be the monitoring biological diversity. So what lives in a given place at a given time and how does that change through time? So what we're doing today is this is some recent fish specimens from Nebraska. Uh, with me today is Mark Everly. Um, he is a recently retired faculty member in the biology department at Fort Hayes. Uh, and I consider him an expert on just about anything aquatic, uh, particularly fish. Uh, he's written several technical publications. He's written a few books, things like that. So Mark, kind of tell us what we're doing and, and what we got these specimens for. Where did they come from? Okay, so these came from surveys in, in this case, in southeastern Nebraska. Uh, we get them every year uh, from different parts of the state. And what we're getting are mostly the smaller individuals uh, when they go out and do their stream surveys. This is a state agency up there that's doing this and they're doing regular monitoring sorts of work. And so the larger individuals that can be easily identified are, are done in the field and then they're released back into the water. Um, but a lot of the smaller fish can be a real challenge to identify. And some of the rarer species um, that aren't quite so common, uh, they don't work with any threatened and endangered species. Um, but the ones that are less common are, are sometimes missed if you don't take time to look at them, which you can't really do when you're out in July uh, the fish uh, suffer if you leave them out there. So they go ahead and preserve a sample from that site uh, of the smaller fish, and then they send those to us in a preserved state, and then we uh, put them in alcohol, and then we go through them individually one by one and come up with a list and number of all the individuals that were at each of the sites, and we send that list to them, and they incorporate it into their, their big data sets. And so that's what we've got here. There's not usually a lot of species uh, in any one of these, uh, maybe 20 or so would be a pretty good site. Uh, most of them are going to be more like about 10 species or so. A lot of them in this case are ones we'd also find around here. So in that case, it makes it pretty easy for me because I've seen these things so many times. And then we put them in jars. Uh, and then we are able to, as Curtis said, put them in the repository so that they're uh, available for anyone that needs to come back and check them. Or if somebody wants to come and do additional research on them. Uh, recently we had uh, Don Cloutman, who um, was a student here as an undergrad, um, got his PhD and retired from teaching up in Minnesota. And he came back and he works on fish parasites, so he could look at these, some of these samples that we've got from all over and pick up uh, the fish and look for the parasites that are also preserved when they're attached to the fish at the same time. And so he and some other folks are working on publications dealing with the fish parasites that are found in different parts of the country. 
Okay. So basically what I do first is I um, take the larger fish, especially the ones like catfish that have spines on them and they might poke you while you're rooting around <laughs> through a pile of fish and set them out in jars. So that's what I've got here so far. And then what's left is basically a lot of the minnows. And so most people would probably look at this tray and think, God, oh, there's like one thing in there. They're all minnows. There are actually at least four species, maybe five species in this batch. And it takes me a little time because I have to look at each one individually. Uh, some of them get a little bit smaller to where I have to put them under a microscope and check some details on them to make sure of what they are. Um, but we basically go through all these then and they'll get sorted into these jars as well uh, and, and put in alcohol for the permanent collection. So. So after Mark is done, he will give me this sheet, which gives all of the locality information, the field number of the site, the date, who collected it, things like that. The data are very, very important. Uh, also, he will give me the list of the species, and then he's going to bring them over in their respective jars for me to catalog. So he will also have how many we've got and the size range, so the smallest one and the largest one within that species. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to take you over to show you the cataloging process. So now we're back over at my computer and I'm going to show you guys the last step in this process. So Mark has now sorted all the individuals by species and he brings all of the individual jars over here to me to catalog and enter into the database. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to walk you through that. So we use specify as our database and I'm going to kind of walk you through what we do here. So there's something called an, a collecting event and I've already entered all that data. So the where and the when and all that stuff is in here. So I can put every catalog number that goes under that collecting event under the event if that makes sense. So the first thing it asks for is the cataloger, so that's me. So we can keep a good record of who did this. So if there's a mistake later, hopefully there is not, we can figure out who the cataloger was at the time. And then it asks for today's date, 10th of January 2022, then determination, so that is the species. So within our database, we have a huge list of species, everything that's in our collection. What we're doing right now is the sucker mouth minnow. Put that in there, it populates it. Who was the determiner? So that would be Mark Eberly. He is the one that sorted them, he's the one that identified them. Then size, if you remember just a few minutes ago, I said that he also measures the smallest one and the largest one. So our size range is 39 to 110. I put that in here. The field number and locality, remember I just said that we already put that in here, so all I have to do is copy and paste the field number in here and it will populate all of that information. Then preparations, so these are all fluid, they're all gonna be in alcohol. The number, remember Mark also counts them, so we know how many is in the jar. Then all I have to do is hit save. When I hit save, it automatically populates the catalog number, so it gives me the very next catalog number that's available, which in this case is 29,868. So we're rapidly approaching 30,000, which is pretty exciting. Now the last thing I got to do is generate a label. So it's really neat because this program talks with this fancy printer very well. So all I have to do is hit print. And it's going to kick out a fancy label with all of the information that I need. So that will go in the jar with the specimens with all of the pertinent information that goes with it. So that's all I've got for today. Now I will just label the jars and we'll get them put on the, the shelves to be stored forever. So thank you guys for watching today. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something today. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us in the New Way to Museum with the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. 
you enjoyed this video, like it and subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell for notifications when we release a new video. Support us on Patreon for early access and exclusive content. You can also follow us on all our social media. Links are found in the description. Thanks for watching and follow your curiosity to new discoveries.